Whether it's comfort cabs or draper tapers, our neighbors to the north have given railroading some of the most visually unique diesel locomotives over the past 40 years. And in this video, we'll be taking a look at them. I'm Railfan AC, and you're watching Trains in the 21st Century. How does that old saying go? What goes up must come down. Well, in the case of temperatures in northeastern Pennsylvania, nothing could be more true. The last few days gave us some outstanding temps reaching around 50 and above. But what goes up must come down, and today we're right back in full winter mode. Gray overcast skies? Check. Snow flurries? Check. Lest one forget that it's still winter. In video T186, we talked about EMD 70 series diesels. The SD75i was picked up by the Bensef, the Ontario Northland, and the Canadian National Railway who had the most units. There's a link to that video in the description box and in the pinned comment, just in case you missed it. But don't be deceived. This isn't part two of that series. This is a look at the crazy and kooky locomotive designs that have come out of Canada over the last 30 years. You might be familiar with the term Draper Taper. If not, here's your crash course introductory. The name Draper Taper refers to locomotives that have a full width car body with tapered sides behind the cab. Canadian National's Assistant Chief of Motor Power, William L. Draper, designed the notch behind the cab which allows for better visibility for the crew, particularly when moving in reverse. Tapered units are not E units or F units, and aren't exclusively EMDs either. Baldwins and Alcos also had a streamlined cowl body unit, so the term shouldn't be confused with any of those engines. Draper tapers were introduced with the Bombardier High Reliability HR616 in 1982, and unlike American cowl body units, the CN chose the cowl body design for mechanical and operational purposes rather than cosmetic reasons. On the exterior, the car body design featured a number of CN innovations including a cab in the early 1970s and has specified it on all new locomotive purchases since 1973. Between 1982 and 1992, CN specified the full car body designs for its locomotives in an effort to provide better working conditions for train crews and maintainers in inclement weather. Units in the Draper Taper class are the GMD SD40-2F Red Barns of the Canadian Pacific, the GMD SD50Fs and SD60Fs, and the HR616 which was basically a full width MLW version of the MLW M636, and even a GE model in the bunch. At one time, 
60 of the unique full cowl car body SD50F units graced the CN roster, as did 64 of the SD60Fs. On the inside, the 60s were mechanically similar to a standard SD60 or SD60M locomotive. They were delivered by EMD between 1985 and 1989. The SD50F predecessors were retired and scrapped with a handful sold to the Dakota, Minnesota Valley, and Western where they operate to this day. The Dash 840 CM, aka C40-8M, was the first new GE locomotive ordered by the Canadian National since they first ordered their GE 44 tonners way back in 1956. The 40 CMs feature the Canadian built DeFasco truck. Both BC Rail and CN had these units and in recent years some were sold to the QNSL for iron ore service. The British Columbia units are essentially the same as the first CN order with the high bell mount above the windows. BC Rail had 22 units in 1990 with four more in 1993. They were transferred over to the Canadian National following the de facto purchase of the British Columbia Railway in 2004. The final units were for the QNSL which had three. They arrived in March of 1994 and were eventually sold to the Andersons. The C40-8M was the last locomotive that was delivered with CN's famous Draper Taper and astonishingly, as of late 2019, all 81-8s were still in service, most still in their original paint with some repainted into the newer CN.CA livery. Today in 2020, the Draper Taper-8 locomotives can be seen all over North America. They made regular visits to Chicago via CN's Grand Trunk Western route through Michigan and Indiana in the mid-1990s and sometimes further as run-through power. But it was the purchase of the Illinois Central in 1998 that really expanded their range of use and it became common to see Draper tapers as far south as the Gulf Coast and all points in between, on and off CNIC track. And speaking of the Illinois Central, the Draper tapers are said to be of similar concept to the Randy Bandy which was named after the duct tape bands used by Randy Stahl to keep old Alco S6s together, an old Illinois Central trick. Draper retired after delivery of the Dash 8s. Following his retirement, CN returned to more off-the-shelf locomotive designs starting with the first Dash 9 order in 1994, some of which had the funky Canadian cab. You may know more details about how the current wide nose units may have strayed from CN's original safety cab design. I'm told that Canadians don't distinguish between the four window or two window cabs. I guess as long as you can see out of them it doesn't really matter. I've also been told that the reason for the four windows was to have smaller panes of glass, the theory being that they would be less prone to breakage or at least a break would be less significant and costly. I want you to hear what I went through to make this video for you. That wind was every bit as nasty and cold as it sounds. Also take note of the NS locomotive number, number 9952. But despite mother nature's fury on me today, Canadian National SD75I number 5690 wasn't having any of it and despite mother nature's fury, it was belting out that sweet EMD music out shouting the mother at her worst. Cowell units don't have tapered sides, so it's hard for them to be used in reverse moves due to the lack of visibility. They were built for style reasons as opposed to mechanical and operational reasons like the Draper Taper units were. Some of the popular Cowell bodied units included the F45, the FP45, Amtrak's SDP40F, the Santa Fe SDF40-2 which was a rebuilt Amtrak SDP40F that was used for freight service, GE had the U30GC, 
Amtrak P30CH and even the F40PH type units could be included in this mix. Having finished up their duties in the Yatesville complex, the K81 crew received clearance from the Riverline dispatcher to move on to the main line and proceed north to DuPont Junction where the Sunbury line begins. Before leaving, the main line switches have to be realigned to the normal position. The SD40-2F was fundamentally an SD40-2 in a Cowell unit four width body. 25 units were built exclusively for the Canadian Pacific in 1988 and 1989. They were CP's only Cowell body units and were numbered between 9000 and 9024. The red barns were the only new locomotives delivered to the CP in the action red paint scheme which was a variation of the multi-mark paint scheme that didn't have the black and white Pac-Man emblem. Two engines. The 9000 and the 9022 were repainted in the two flags paint scheme. In 2015, the Central Maine and Quebec Railway acquired 10 of the red barns from CP and all but one were repainted into the CMQs light blue and silver within two years. The one that wasn't repainted blue and silver was repainted into the black, red and gray paint scheme of the Bangor and Aroostook Railroad as a heritage unit in recognition of some of CMQ's trackage in Maine. By late 2016, CP had retired all of the remaining red barns and ironically enough, in 2019, they purchased the CMQ, getting back some of those red barns that they retired. So you thought you'd seen the last of the kooky Canadian diesels. Not hardly. Back in 2015, Canadian National Train 31T to Montreal had a super rare GMD SD40-2W leading an SD75I, a Dash 9, and an NS SD40-2. The 5258 was one of only two test bed GMDs, those were SD40-2Ws with a fuel tender in between that had been converted to run on LNG fuel for test purposes a few years back and acquired the SD45 like flares on the rear of the long hood in the process. It's since been converted to regular diesel operation. The first Dash 9s ordered by the CN and some ordered by the BC Rail had the unique four piece Canadian style windshield that we talked about earlier in the video. Canadian Pacific GP40-2s number 4650 and 4653, both ex-Boston and Mains, sported a new paint scheme unlike anything ever seen on CP diesels when I first saw it back in 2015. The first thought that came to my mind was, what's up with that? Apparently, what was up is that it comes about that there was a high demand for local power on the DNH at that time, and the units were quickly painted in Binghamton, New York to satisfy that demand. Shock. Surprise to me at last, not only the paint scheme itself, which reminds me of Santa Claus, but also the fact that I was unaware that the shops at Binghamton had locomotive painting capability. Take a look at the side of the former Vancouver Olympics locomotive number 8876. Now take a look at the other side. Notice anything different? The Canadian Pacific on the engineer's side is written in plain English, while the same thing on the conductor's side is spelled out in French. 
Canadian Pacific AC4400 CW number 9615 wears the CPR Beaver paint scheme with the RCMP, that's the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, musical ride. Now that's for Carousel de la GRC. <laughs> Don't ask me what that is all about, but the logo is on both sides of the cab. Another oddball AC4400 is the 9773. Note the large two flags behind the cab. They designate this as a locomotive that once pulled the CP Holiday Train. I caught this rarity way back in 2016, but it was only just a day or two ago that I actually found out its intriguing heritage. Many special thanks to Railfan Owen for this information. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. And as long as I'm talking about Railfan Owen, there's a handful of rail fans that I've been wanting to name check in a video, and now I finally have an opportunity to do it. Let's start with Railfan Owen out of Northeast Ohio. Or at least that's where he spends his day stalking the rail, so I'm assuming that's where you live. Next, we have the real Canadian rail fan out of Ontario, Canada. He's the reason why the PSR videos are taking so long to finish. He was kind enough to gift me a book. In fact, two books. One on Hunter Harrison and another on the Lamantic Fire up in Canada. I hope I'm pronouncing Lamantic right. The next man in line is the rail fan rookie out of Norfolk, Virginia area, a.k.a. Anthony Martini. Personally, I think he should be called the Rail Fan Reporter. He's kind of a cross between Distant Signal, Jaw Tooth, and Millennium Force all rolled into one. And speaking of all rolled up, he's also got a little bit of Rail Roll 82 in him. If, you have, if you're not familiar with Rail Roll 82, he actually lost his channel. It was hacked a few weeks ago. He's working to get it back from YouTube, but for now, he does have a second channel started called Rail Roll 82. So if you want to go give him some support, I'm sure he'd be very appreciative of that. Next in line is Bessemer and Lake Erie, which, as you can imagine, that's Woody Rail fans. Again, another one out of Northeast Ohio or maybe Northwest Pennsylvania, but he's got a really, really good channel. Another one out of, I believe, Northeast Ohio is Andrew's Train Stuff. And then there's the CSX NS Train Videos channel, which is out of Cincinnati. Further south is Louisville and Nashville Entertainment, who spends his days stalking the CNOTP. Down in the deep south in Mississippi, we have Noah's Rail Fanning. And another one who I believe is in Mississippi, NS Railroad Fan Productions. Did I get that right? Yeah, I got that right. NS Railroad Fan. No, 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 no. Yeah, 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 yeah. NS Railroad Fan Productions. That's a confusing one. But anyway, all of these channels will be linked in the description and in the pinned comment. So you can check them out. Once the K-81 left Yatesville, its destination was its home base at Taylor Yard. Taylor is where it all comes together. The railroad happenings in northeastern Pennsylvania, that is. Draper Taper, Canadian Taper Cabs, Safety Cabs, Wide Cabs, Dog Houses, and Covered Wagons. Many crews called them Dog Houses. It's also said that many crews hated them because you had to walk through the engine room to get from unit to unit in a consist, and the handbrake is in there too. Having been inside the engine compartment of one myself, 
I can tell you that when the engine's going, it is really, really, really loud. On CN, the term covered wagons was also used in reference to their cowl units and is considered interchangeable with the term doghouse. Covered wagon more properly refers to a true F unit, or at least that's what I'm told, some of which lasted long enough that CN still has employees who worked on them. I'm talking about the 9100 series on Canadian National. Then there's the old nickname Beetle, which was for the rebuilt F7AUs that were converted to B units by plating over the windows and number boards. They made for some really unconventional ABA sets. One last little nugget of information about Canadian locomotives. As for the diesel classification numbers and other such digits that are shown on the cab sides of CN's diesel locomotives, the classification scheme also used by VIA or VIA can be found at the CNRHA website along with an excellent explanation of how it all works together on their website. There's a link to the page in the description and in the pinned comment if you're interested in learning more about it. New locomotives and some repaints still have the class lettering on them, but nobody seems to use it anymore, at least not in transportation, and simply refer to the units by their cab number series. Of course, CP has their own classification scheme, and I'm not exactly sure how it works, but I'm pretty sure that the 9000 series red barns were classified as the DRF-30Y. Leave a comment below if you know something different. In addition to the K81 and the normal through freights, there was a unique visitor in Taylor Yard today. Train 22K is a Chicago to Ayer, Massachusetts intermodal train that runs the Chicago Line, the Lake Erie District, the Southern Tier, the Freight Line, and the Pan Am Southern. It's a single stack train called Filet, and it's because of the four and a half mile long Hoosac Tunnel in Vermont, which can't accommodate double stack that the containers can only be run one tier high. So what's it doing way down here in Taylor? A roof collapse of sorts within the Hoosac Tunnel prompted many of NS's Pan Am Southern trains to detour over other routes. Most of them utilized the CSX and their Boston and Albany line, but today this I2K intermodal extra was refused by CSX, prompting the train to run south along the Sunbury to Harrisburg. From there, I don't know what became of it. Maybe it was unloaded in Harrisburg or Rutherford Yard. Maybe it was unloaded at Bethlehem. Maybe it went to Croxton, New Jersey and was unloaded there or went north on CSX to Massachusetts. Whatever happened to it once it reached Harrisburg, I have no idea. One last thing before we end today's history lesson. Do you remember when we were back in Yatesville and I told you to pay attention to the cab number of the Dash 944 CW? Can you remember the number? It was 9952. Now, did you happen to notice the cab number of the Dash 944 CW on the I2K intermodal that we saw at Taylor Yard? Okay, that was 9972. 20 digits apart. But the reason I bring that up is because both of these engines are part of the last order of Dash 9s on the NS. So they're two of the newest Dash 9s on the Norfolk Southern. But more important, the 9972, we've seen that engine before. Can you remember where? Here's a little hint. It was in May of 2017 on the last high and wide movement out of air products in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania to Lee Heighton and Packerton Yard to the NS from the Reading and Northern.
If you like this video, hit the like button because it really helps the channel out when you do that. And if you're not a subscriber to this channel, then make sure to become a subscriber by hitting the big red button. That's your boarding pass for this journey into 21st century railroading. And when you subscribe, make sure that you click the bell. Doing this makes sure that you get all notifications every time we upload new videos. And this is super important. Make sure that you're keeping up with our community section. That's where all channel announcements are made and where we post important updates and other relevant channel information. It's also where you'll find cool photos, obscure videos, additional information on railroading, and lots of talk about trains. Lastly, if you'd like to support this channel in addition to what I just talked about, there's a PayPal link in the description and in the pinned comment. A buck a month can go a long way and five bucks goes even further. But if you can't support with money, never fear. Likes, comments, and shares are always free. For Trains 21, call me AC.